Are we about to see stock markets plunge into another crisis period? Well, according to the bonds market, that might be what we're about to see. Stock market traders, meanwhile, are living in potentially a la-la land and they don't believe anything's wrong. Why is there such a big disconnect and what does this mean for you as traders and investors in the markets right now? Well, today we're diving into the data of what this differential means and why nobody's talking about it. And more importantly, what the markets are actually doing after the Fed's balance sheet massively spiked since Credit Suisse and Silicon Valley Bank. It's super interesting in markets right now, but let's look at all the hottest charts together. Well, welcome back everyone to The Daily Show where we talk about the macro lead news and of course the key levels that you need to be watching for the next days into weeks and months. We'll begin here with Disney because they've announced one of three phases where they're actually firing people, 7,000 people about to lose their jobs and unfortunately this is happening all over the industry. I've been talking to people that own small businesses since Silicon Valley Bank, since Credit Suisse they've noticed the taps have been turning off. And while we do have liquidity in the system, I expect unemployment now to show signs of rising. Now, we've talked about this before, and basically when we see unemployment rising from the lows, that usually means six months away, there is a recession coming for the US. That is when we have bond yield inversion. And at the moment, it seems like every single one of the bond yields has been inverted thanks to the Fed's actions over the last year. So I wanted to discuss this chart to begin with, move or bond implied volatility versus the VIX. Now, a lot of people are blaming zero DTE options as basically ruining the VIX, and that still could be the case. We're seeing effectively almost all of or over half of all of the traded options under 10 day expiry. So less than 10 days until they expire. And that's a big deal. It means that there's a lot of hedging going on in the current market conditions rather than being spread out over the longer term. But what happens when we get readings like this? Well, it basically means that we're seeing stock market volatility plunging to new lows. In fact, it's the bottom 7% of all readings now. How could we be at a point like this when we have Silicon Valley Bank, we have Credit Suisse, we have Deutsche Bank and we have so many others, probably hundreds of other smaller banks around the world in significant financial crisis. Well, when you get this type of rotation or you get this type of move and you get the bonds market totally disagreeing with stock markets, you do need to watch out. Here are some of the other notable reads that we've had in markets. And a lot of them have been near kind of calm before the storm kind of areas. And that's pretty much why I've labeled today's thumbnail this way, the calm before the storm. As we can see, one week, two weeks, one month, and even 12 months later, yes, it looks like only 50% of the time the markets are bullish. But I think what's more important is look at some of the pain that happens during some of these reads. Sideways or kangaroo action into declines is the most common action once you've seen bond market traders and stock market traders disagree with each other. What does this mean for defensives such as T-notes? Well, we saw a massive sell-off on T-notes over the last 24 hours. Basically, the main reason here is a mixture of yield increases, which we'll look at later on. But again, it kind of points towards usually T-notes doing a little bit better over the next couple of months because when we've had readings like this, the market has moved at least temporarily defensive. Will that occur again? Well, it's something that we're certainly looking at. So why have markets been stabilized and why are stocks showing a very different picture to what the bonds market is showing? Well, a huge portion of this has to do with this chart here. I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? All of the tapering that was done over one year was half reversed in literally a week and a half. This is the Federal Reserve coming in when they're claiming they're tapering to literally support the market and the actions of these banks with their unscrupulous lending to zombie style companies. Now, <laughs> it's not great, is it? But when we look at this in real time, which is a chart that I update you on, it hasn't changed much, by the way. It's just like sitting like that at the moment. We have seen a mass injection and then they've tried to reduce it a little bit, even though it doesn't look like it, after they're doing their mass injection. That stabilized the markets. What tends to do well when the Federal Reserve injects? Growth. And growth alone is usually the first of the injections. 
Now, this is where things get really interesting on the markets. And I shared it over on our Twitter, follow at FX Evolution, links in the first description down below, the link tree if you're interested in following. And I shared a couple of charts. The first one I want to look at is this, and it has to do with rotation. So if we take since March the 8th, 2023, we can see that the markets have been moving into growths and defensives. We obviously have been talking about defensives a lot on this channel moving through this period, but growths were the massive injection due to the Fed's balance sheet. They came in early, earlier than I expected as well, but as soon as you see a Fed injection in the balance sheet, that has historically meant a massive movement towards growth and that's what's gone so well. Communication services, technology, they've been the winners. Semiconductors, of course, the biggest winner overall. But look at the rest of the market. It's actually very sick. Economically sensitive sectors are lagging. We've got industrials, materials, real estate, energy, financials, all terrible in this market. And while the S&P 500 is made up of so many companies, 500 in total, we know that it's being held up by just a few. In fact, it's specifically being held up by the biggest 10 stocks. You know, specifically those tech stocks are really holding it through. At the same time, we have stock market traders claiming that growth is about to happen. I think a lot of this estimate growth actually has to do with cutting the fat and firing staff, as we know that's a huge portion of overall business costs. But then we've got US real GDP year over year is expected to actually decline. So what's looking like at this point is that the stock market is pricing in the Federal Reserve continuing to stimulate the markets while the actual real reality of the markets or the world economies, especially the US economy here, is a potential chance of recession. That's why we're getting such huge disconnect. I also want to bring up this that just shows you how economists have no idea what's going on in the markets right now. Last week, we reported that during the 3rd May Fed reporting, like the 3rd of May target rate probabilities, they had it at almost 80 to 90% chance of no rate cut. Over the last 24 hours, we've moved back to almost 50-50. So each day, this is realistically moving from 50-50 between a rate hike and a pause or nothing at all. And then it's going to 80, 90 in terms of pauses. There is a huge disconnect and the market is actually trading at these levels. And you'll see why the market's trading at an equilibrium zone, which is completely neutral at this stage, which makes it very difficult to figure out exactly what it's trying to do next. I believe it's waiting to see whether it gets more injections from the Fed in combating effectively what is going on right now, which is a massive sickness. Now, why do we know a massive sickness has happened? Well, the Fed always do this. Every time they raise rates, they destroy the economy and they break something that they then have to stimulate through. We had that back in the global financial crisis. We had that back over here. Funnily enough, coming into the pandemic, we were going to fall regardless of whether it was the pandemic or not. Bonds markets were telling us there was inversion and something bad was on the horizon for late 19 into early to mid 2020. I know it seems ridiculous, but that's actually what the market was telling us at the time. We get the same thing during 2000s into 2001, and we get a break that, of course, famously happened in the 70s and 80s several times. Fed pivots, which means that they go from moving towards uh, hikes to basically cuts and stabilization usually bring with them bad stock market results. So what makes this time different? Well, at this stage, the stock market literally is pricing in no recession. They're saying there is no recession. We're like here right now, neutralized. We're waiting for federal support because we're so used to it. The Fed's always there. They've got our back. Yeah, they've got our back. That's what they say. And then we're going to get a huge, huge increase over time due to the balance sheet expanding and us going back into growth and all these things. But the bonds market is telling us a recession's coming. We're seeing the signs of, of course, unemployment hiking up, and that's going to no doubt put some pressure on people's credit and the lines that are out there right now. Things are looking a little grim. So the markets are telling us a very different story right now, that is the stock market, from the bonds market. Bonds market says we should be more on this scale, moving towards new lower lows in the future. But the stock market saying, no, 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 the Fed's here, they've got our back. And that's why recently we've seen such a big disconnect between certain things. As soon as we saw that injection of capital, specifically from the Fed, what happened? Smart money piled in. What did they pile into? Growth and defensives. 
You can literally see it on the charts. Growth and defensives was where they went and dumb money got left kind of, you know, out of the circle, selling off, thinking, oh, everything's going so bad. So I expect this chart to modify pretty quickly if the Fed continues to taper off down. In fact, I've already started to see the movements from the bigger money managers selling this rip as they wait to see the next positioning from the Federal Reserve and from, of course, everything else that's going on. We do also know that EPS growth turned negative recently. This has actually happened at the start of this year during January. I keep bringing it up because if we go into a recession, if it looks like that's on the cards, expect this to really disconnect from what stock traders are telling us about the market. And if that happens, well, we know what tends to go on. If EPS turns negative and the earnings come out and they don't represent what the stocks believe is going to happen right now, which is, of course, earnings growth, then all of a sudden we're in a very bad looking market. We're either in kangaroo, which is what happened during 1516 when this occurred, or we're in some kind of declining market due to earnings. And that's only a few weeks around the corner. So make sure to subscribe to this channel because we'll be covering earnings in mass detail. And remember what's happening with earnings, banks are coming out first. So it's going to be, you know, potentially quite brutal on earnings season if the markets haven't been pricing in the allocated risks towards that time. We also know that basically no risk is being put into stocks. We're still trading around this level. We tend to see if a recession occurs, ERP spike up hard. Now, this is not my research. It's Morgan Stanley, Mike Wilson's research, but I think it's an important factor and I think it's overlooked by a lot of traders out there. And I keep bringing it up because it's important to do so. So what are the facts? Well, we know right now that bonds traders are freaking out in comparison to stocks traders. We can kind of understand why, because it's the Fed balance sheet and they're expecting, of course, a rate cut in the horizon future. But this is where we get into the charts. So let's take a look at the charts and we'll start off here with, I think, the first exhibit, which is a very good one to have in the future. If the US two-year goes underneath the federal funds rate, it almost always means a pivot's coming. In fact, it's never been wrong. So when that occurs, a Fed pivot is generally on the horizon. We kind of already know it is. We also know that markets will be very sensitive to yields moving forward. So here we have the US 10-year, and you can see this, this key level, which I keep talking about, which is 3.32% on the US 10-year. Now, the US 10-year is dictated to by the market. Effectively, the market's fair trading this. They spiked it up the other day, pushing it higher in terms of what their expectation is moving forward over 10 years for yields. If we take a look at the two-year, the two-year also spiked up. So I think the market's starting to rebalance a little bit from its initial freak out from Silicon Valley Bank. And they're starting to say, wait a second, is the Fed really going to pivot as fast as we expect it? Remember in previous Fed periods, if we go back over here to the US two-year, you can kind of see what the federal rate, the Federal Reserve does. It pivots, it sits, then it cuts. And it does sit for a few months generally. The markets aren't even expecting a few months. At the moment, the markets are saying, you're going to pivot, you're not going to go any higher, and then you're going to cut immediately, basically one to two months afterwards. Now, the Federal Reserve has done that before, like over here, but in general, they tend to hold it for a few months and then flatline it, then sell. So this is going to be a big component. They're going to cut rates moving forward, but how fast are they going to do it? A disconnect between stocks and of course, the bond market, and more importantly, stocks and the Fed is probably going to become one of the clear storylines moving forward through the next couple of weeks. Let's move over here to, of course, high yield corporate bonds. Now, we know that high yield junk bonds are very sensitive to the bond market right now and the Fed. And more importantly, with that raise in rates we saw over the last 24 hours, we saw junk start to fall down. Now, I've got an alert here at 70 I actually want to alert here at around 72.50. If the market falls underneath that level, what does that mean? Well, it means that junk bonds are falling through the floor and the bonds market and the stock market are disconnecting. I would generally trust the bonds market over stock market. <laughs> stock guys are just interested in profit, fear, greed, that's it. Whereas bonds traders are interested in risk. So if the bonds market pushes HYG to new lows, we know that pretty much correlates very well to the S&P 500. And it's been one of our indicators to proof whether the moves are correct or wrong. So definitely follow that. Keep it on your charts. 
TLT dropped. Well, this makes sense. US 10-year dropped. However, it is dropping at a rate that sh should be paid attention to. Certainly, treasuries are not looking as healthy as they should. And I believe we should be about 106 or even 108 at the current rate if we were healthy on treasuries. And I, I just feel like we should be about 106, 108 based on where the US 10-year is currently. So we'll, we'll keep watching this chart, but it dropped. The reason yields went up. Let's move over to the US dollar. So the US dollar certainly did drop back off its supply zone. So tick for that. Very nice. Glad to see it kind of fall back over. It's left a gap here on the futures market and we jump back into demand zone. So I like this red box to see some type of buyers. I'd like to like to find some buyers recommencing back into this market. They haven't come through yet, but this is an interesting level. If we take a look at the daily here, and we scroll on in, we can see that bullish hammer that came through. It's still in a downward trend, so we need to be aware that we'd have to be nimble and fast, and we've basically come off this trend line. So at this stage, we are in a demand on the small time frames with an overarching kind of downward trend concept, and if the US 10-year goes underneath 3.32, you're going to have to expect the US dollar to continue to weaken. It's finding some relief, though, for now. Trend line, all of these things should be watched. What about gold? Well, gold does like decreasing yields. We saw an increase in yield, so it fell off. And realistically, it's trading within a very pivotal area where I expect it to create either distribution or accumulation. The easy money on gold is now over. Now we have to wait for the next move. We know that US $2,000 an ounce is a huge deal for gold. It made it through it a few times, but never stuck. So no monthly, no weekly kind of getting through properly. Let's have a look at the monthly just to really show you here how big the close for this week is for gold. We're going to focus on the close for the monthly. I believe it's either in distribution or accumulation. We can't tell yet. We know the market is consolidating with big orders. Once we see a clean direction, we should get a nice momentum move. But for now, we're stuck in the middle of the range, which makes it a little bit challenging. Copper still sitting in our intersection zone. So this is a mixture between health of the economy and realistically central banks and governments around the world and what they're doing. So we'll keep looking at that. We've got natural gas coming down. The widow maker continues its way down. I'd expect it to swing 2.09. Be very, very careful with this one. I know people still looking at it, but it's not a day trade generally. It is more of a multi-month approach and you've got to be careful of its swinging lows. It looks like it formed the start of a base, but I want to know what it happens here and then we can define it. Like we've been saying, we thought there would be bounces here. We got that. Now we've dropped back down and we think it's going to swing 2.09. So we think it's going underneath that level. We have to pay attention to it. Oil did really nicely. Nice increase in yields, pushed oil back up. Beautiful thing. Came back to a great zone. Previous support becomes resistance. You've got breaks of structure, all sorts of things. It's certainly a critical zone. I, I could see oil back to 76 a barrel. Uh, this move from here to here was very likely. Now we're moving towards, okay, where is the sell? Do we see a sell? Is it here or is it in the structure it is currently? This is a area where I expect bears to try to recommit. If they can't though, next up 76 to 77 in that structure there. And I think this is critical. This is critical. I'm not very bullish on oil at this stage. I'm actually overall bearish on it, but I like to see the move to where it's gone. And these levels here, I, I'm kind of looking for signs. So we'll see when we can update on that. Let's move over to Tesla. Uh, it's trading pretty nicely, actually. Came off our heavily traded zone, our 61.8, and a few other reasons why we like this level. We also know that we have an expected weekly options high up here and a low down here. There's a gap sitting. So if the markets do turn negative, we have to expect that that at least Tesla is going to want to put pressure on that 183, kind of 31, and it might find some buyers around this area, but then you've got to work out whether it's temporary or whether it's just all part of that drop, which we eventually expect to occur back to that 140, 145 zone. So we're still targeting that overall in terms of larger swing based on this being distribution but we'll, we'll pay attention to it. And of course, we'll come back to um, Tesla as much as we can. Depends where the stocks start pricing in this bond risk. Yeah, that's going to be a big thing. Well, what about Apple? Well, it keeps trading at this very weird range. I could see Apple still doing this. Um, if it does and it fills the gap that we've got up there, 
and then it comes back down. We're in distribution. We can call that pretty much a Wyckoff. We've seen the hand of the market at that point and we'll know kind of what they're doing. This is a critical level for it. We do know that there's a good chance the bears sit here, but if this ends up breaking out with a with a daily close, we have to assume there is more rallies to be had. I will use the NASDAQ well over this though to make those decisions. All we know at this stage, it's critical. NVIDIA also at critical. Everybody's writing articles about how great this is. That usually means it's kind of almost over. I mean, if it was, yeah, it's great to write articles over here about how great it is, but everyone, there's a crowded trade. AI is now crowded. It was talked about being a bubble over here. Now it's everybody thinks the moon is going to happen and it's going to $700 a stock. And I've seen some ridiculous concepts. So when you get ridiculous concepts, you usually know you're near the end. That doesn't mean we have found the end. There is no sign yet in these markets that this thing's coming back down. So be careful about going against NVIDIA, even though it looks completely overbought. What about XLY versus XLP, the American consumer? One third of the US economy, this shows us in, in kind of stock form. Well, it keeps weakening. That shows us that the market is turning defensive. And we can see that based on the fact that the market's only bought growth stocks that tend to do well with the Fed balance sheet increase. That's what they've bought. If that continues to taper off, you have to expect them to fade. Basically, you would be looking at them buying into it, sure. And then if we don't see the Fed tapering, if we don't see the Fed tapering, they'll probably keep going up. But if we see the Fed tapering like they claim they're going to do, well, then what do we expect? Probably goes down. Let's move over to the DAX. It's holding in its own little thing. I think the DAX is a bit boring at the moment. It's at a resistance, but this is this is strange. So we'd need to see it effectively close underneath that price there. And then we move to probably 14,000. So that's 14, kind of 780. I'd like to see it underneath that zone at the moment, just sitting through here. XJO for the Australians out there. Interesting market into our green box. It's finding buyers for now. So that's good. Um, it's doing really well off that yield spike that we just saw in the last 24 hours. If that continues, we could see some relief up to the 7200 zone for XJO. But if yields start coming down, be careful. And if it flogs through this range of 6900, I think the Australian market's going back into, you know, 60, possibly even 64, 65s, and certainly 67s at that point. So we've got, you know, very key level here. Is this distribution or accumulation? We'll find out, I believe, in the next trading week or so. IWM, Russell 2000, this is the most, we'll move into the US market now. This is the most important chart, I believe, for the US market at this stage. The small cap zombie companies. There's lots of zombies in here, lots of bad companies, and we know the Russell swung the low. So we know the Russell came underneath, found buyers, look at the volume. It's remained high. Wyckoff said the law of effort is very important. So we've got a lot of trades going on and look at this Look at this uh, market here. This is the Russell 2000 futures. So the futures market swung as well, found strong buyers. And I can tell you right now, it is back to basically a midpoint of this range. Now, if the market breaks through 1800, well, we have to have a different story. I would expect the Fed balance sheet to be coming in big time, support to be coming in. This will be a critical zone. But at this stage, could it be that it just goes like that? If we get a closure underneath 1700, I've remained on this one. I believe it's a big indicator that things are very, very sick in these markets and the zombie companies are going to get crunched. The Russell can lead markets. Remember that. So at the moment, it looks all good. It looks very clean. You know, you're going to say, oh, look at all these wicks. Buyers are here. I can totally see why it found another rally day, but it hit equilibrium. It hit the midpoint of this. So today's trade will be very interesting. The, the movement forward here into the Tuesday action, I would kind of expect to see weakness. That's the way you'd have to think about it. Let's move over now to the queues. So we'll actually look here at just the queues themselves. Monthly is going to be a big one. If the, if the sellers are going to come in, you'd think they'd want to come in this week. Here's the weekly. Here's the daily. So you can see it's trading within those inside candles. So basically we have Doge, we have a rejection wick, a Doji, long leg Doji. And then we've got kind of like these, these candles inside it. So it could be that it's pricing for a breakout or it could be to sell off. And that's the problem. But which one is it? How can we figure that out? Well, weekly here, it had a decent weekly close. The daily certainly hasn't confirmed that we're going bullish yet. The two hour, if we scroll into here, is trading within 
that initial move that happened off news last week. So I think if we find weakness, I want to watch the reaction at 12,500. You know, patience, react, don't predict. If markets come to this area, let's just say we have demand. We have a very key level. I'm just telling you that it's a key level. And I'm interested what happens here and here. Basically, I want to know what happens at the extreme high and what happens if the market goes underneath these levels and then swings the lows and then starts to find buys. If that happens, oh, get ready. I think the rocket ship is coming through because at that point, what you're doing is you're taking out a lot of hunts. You're going down to a key level. You're finding demand and then you're just absolutely slamming on the 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 bull the bull train. But if we end up floating through this area, I don't really see much buying until back in the 12,000s. So it could be a pretty brutal sell-off for tech stocks should we manage to breach these areas and find and find that weakness. We're stuck in literally range mode at the moment and we haven't come out of it yet. Does the S&P 500 show us the same? Here is the highs and the lows. You can see it filled the gap. Nice. Uh, I posted in our private community on the chat. I just literally said, if the market opens like extreme, like 4,000, it's probably going to you know, basically have that rally fade, which is what it did. It just faded straight back through to a gap fill. And that was a decent trade on Monday if you took it. I mean, certainly a, a pretty replicable kind of strategy, especially considering we're coming into the most important zone. If you take a look at the daily close, close near its lows was a rejection. A lot of people see that as a shooting star or pin bar. And if you consider the level it's coming off, that's the most important thing. This is a super level. It is the most traded level. It, it, it's a big zone. There is positions. This is literally neutral. So I like to think of this at the moment being neutral in the market. So we've tested neutral from the bottom up. If sellers are going to show in, they need to show here. And then I'm looking for it to come back down to the 3860s. And we, you know, it's, it kind of needs to show that pretty soon. If we go to the 10-minute chart or 15-minute chart, you'll notice the interaction with our most traded zone, the interaction through this level. Each time we hit here, what's going on? We seem to be selling it. So at this stage, you'd have to think the bears are committed more than the bulls. I'd like to see a new low taken, 39.70. If that happens, they're probably looking at rallies fading. And, and that's kind of the way we've broken down this market at this stage. The US 500 is creepy. It's a neutral zone. I don't know what you think. Let me know in the comments down below. But I believe it's at the creep zone where everybody is confused and they're all neutral. And, the, and you can see it. You can see it in price. <laughs> that rotation was weird. They went defensive and tech. Why would they do that? I mean, it makes perfect sense. Fed balance sheet and they're freaked out. So defensive is good because they're freaked out. Fed balance sheet, well, I got to go buy the Fed balance sheet stocks. So that's all they've done and they've sold everything else. So it's actually a sick market with no volatility in it. Super weird. <laughs> and that's what makes trading and investing so interesting. And hopefully you enjoy this stuff and you know, you follow the channel and all of those types of things. Share with your family and friends, of course, if you're interested. So let's move over to Bitcoin. So it keeps holding our little yellow, uh, little white line here. And the white line keeps getting bought up, which is nice. But yeah, I mean, it it needs to hold. <laughs> I, I've talked about 30,200 a lot. You know, I've done some work on this. I thought Bitcoin, and I still think at this stage, Bitcoin should move into that. But it becomes increasingly difficult for Bitcoin to go through if the stock market is going to sell off. So, I mean, we'll, we'll find out whether stocks actually do want to fall through, through the Tuesday session, et cetera. But at this stage, Bitcoin, it's either an accumulation or distribution. We don't know yet. I'm still looking for the 30,200 because that's what we kind of expected after we broke through 25.2. We expected big, big move. We get a big move. I, I just like, I'm as greedy. I like, I like even more, you know, more would be nice. Uh, less is, is not as good. Could, could it fall off here? Absolutely. You can see support becoming resistance. There's many technical theories that'll push this. I just tend to like to see something like that happening and and then that could push us back down into, into the lows. Uh, we'll talk about crypto more though in the future as we get clearer pitches, clearer, clearer, clearer. We want to know that. What about the market news moving forward? It's not that much. So it's going to be allowed to be pretty technical. We've got CB Consumer Confidence 10 a.m. Tuesday, March 28th. So that's an interesting one. And then we've got Friday, March 31st, 8.30 a.m. Core PC price index. Daylight savings time as well for the Australian and New Zealand audience out there. And uh, yeah, if you've enjoyed today's video, subscribe, smash the like button. And also remember to follow us on the socials, follow our Twitter, 
join uh, and get three free trading cheat sheets. It's literally just put your email in, you'll get them sent to you. And of course, if you want to follow us or check out any of our website kind of courses and stuff, if you're interested in some of this stuff, I would suggest the advanced scalping masterclass or day trading class. Uh, that stuff is is pretty phenomenal. So hopefully you enjoy it. And yeah, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.